tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It feels um, kind of sad because um, I had a lot of good memories here. But then again, I get to do things differently. The slow road to rebuilding. After a wildfire wiped out their homes, we check in with some people in West Kelowna. Plus. It's concerned. What's at the root cause of it? What are we doing? Victoria's police chief and mayor address worries about several recent stabbings, some of them deadly. And. There's a bunch of infrastructure that's not being used right now, and I think that it could be utilized in a way more efficient way. From former post offices to old army buildings, the federal budget has some ideas for new housing in BC. This is CBC Vancouver News. Hello, I'm Dan Burr. Thanks for joining us. The 2024 federal budget has now been officially delivered, and there are not many surprises. The government had already announced several programs in the weeks ahead. The big question, though, was how they would pay for them. The CBC's Rafi Bujikanian has our top story. Mr. Speaker, we are acting today to ensure fairness for every generation. With multiple announcements over the course of weeks aimed at addressing Canada's housing crisis, the government has revealed how it plans to pay. To responsibly build a fairer future for younger Canadians, we need to make sure our tax system is fairer. That means going after capital gains, like the sale of a secondary home, for the country's wealthiest and corporations. Individuals to pay taxes on two-thirds of anything they make above $250,000 a year. Businesses fully moving to that rate. This new revenue will help make life cost less for millions of Canadians, particularly millennials and Gen Z. Support for the Liberals with that demographic has plummeted in opinion polls. The $23 billion housing program in this budget hopes to win them back. $8 billion of that in spending, the rest in loans. Ottawa even wants to convert some underused Canada post and military public land into housing and spend up to $500 million to buy unused public land from provinces or cities. For this observer, an obvious play. Targeting the main political areas, I think, that are really challenge this government, like, like housing and affordability, might not even be in their jurisdiction, but they're responding to the need for action by Canadians. Certainly the text emphasizes uh, the demographic that's, I think, become a little distant from this government. But to even get there, the minority Liberals need opposition help to pass the budget, and it's not clear they'll have any. This is the ninth deficit. The ninth deficit after the Prime Minister promised the budget would balance itself. Conservatives will vote against this wasteful inflationary budget. We have some serious concerns and I want to hear from the Prime Minister what his plan is to address those concerns. With surveys also showing concerns over too much spending, the government does not want to increase its $40 billion deficit this year. This may not be the last pre-election budget the Liberals are planning, but they are banking on it, paying off for them at the polls. Rafi Bujikan, Young CBC News, Ottawa. Now, housing affordability is perhaps the biggest line item in today's budget, and it's one of the biggest challenges, as we know, facing people in this province. Michelle Gassou breaks down what's in the budget for B.C. Budget 2024 honed in on housing and young people. Do you rent or own? I don't know. I live with my parents. Okay, yeah, okay. classic. In Canada's most expensive province, people say they expect the federal government to help get the housing situation under control. There's a bunch of infrastructure that's not being used right now, and I think that it could be utilized in a way more efficient way. For young people, I definitely like the 5% and 10% incentive that they gave to help with homes the last number of years. If they could do more of that, that's great. Today's budget includes $8.5 billion in new spending on housing and a promise to build 3.9 million homes by 2031. But the feds are also looking at some more creative options, like turning Department of Defense properties into homes. One of those under consideration, the Armory in Vernon. 
And if you've ever wanted to live in a post office, Canada Post properties are also being assessed, including those in North Vancouver and Port Moody. Ottawa is also looking at six other Canada Post properties across BC that could become homes. This is real catch up. And, you know, I, I really hope any future governments that come on will actually heed this, that this is what's really needed right now. Um, we need more nonprofit housing being built. We need more purpose built rental being built. In some ways, BC and the feds are already in line on the housing file. After precedent setting BC Builds legislation was introduced in February, other provinces are now expected to meet the benchmark set in this province to access that federal funding. Ideally, there will be a greater uptake uh, in BC of some of these federal initiatives because there is alignment um, between the provincial and federal government to... Um, to, to you know, increase the supply of overall supply of housing. Still, the housing crisis in this province feels particularly dire. It is obviously appealing, but they have been saying that for the past couple of years, and it just seems like it's getting worse. Renters, owners, and hopeful buyers alike will have to wait and see whether the measures make a dent. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. And we will have much more on the federal budget later in the newscast. Vancouver police say a man has now been charged with second-degree murder in the stabbing death of a woman on the south side of the city. It happened April 3rd. The victim, now identified as 49-year-old Gertrude Chong, died after officers found her on the ground near Fraserview Golf Course. The VPD says 29-year-old Eric Lau of Burnaby was arrested the next day. He's now charged with second-degree murder. Police also say Lau and Chong did know each other, but won't say how. Meanwhile, police say a suspect has been charged after another man was mistakenly shot in the face in downtown Vancouver on April 3rd. The BC Prosecution Service charged Justin Delaney Littlewolf with one count of discharging a firearm, contrary to Section 244.1 of the Criminal Code, and one count of aggravated assault. Police say Littlewolf is accused of shooting a 46-year-old man near Homer and West Pender in early April. The force says the victim was not the intended target, and while he's expected to survive, police say his physical and emotional injuries will last much longer. Meanwhile, a man accused of stabbing two food delivery drivers this past December during a robbery has now pleaded guilty. It happened in Olympic Village. Sheldon Ilbegi Asli was charged with theft under $5,000 and two counts of assault with a weapon. The 21-year-old is accused of pepper spraying uh, someone he met up with to buy a computer graphics card. While he, when he ran away, two food delivery people tried to intercept him and he stabbed them. Ilbegi Asli's lawyer has asked the court to consider a psychiatric assessment to address addiction and mental health diagnoses along with treatment. Victoria's police chief and mayor are speaking up over a series of recent knife attacks, some of them deadly. While the numbers are similar to previous years, it has some officials worried. Our Zara Premji joins us now with more. Zara, what are P police and, and the mayor saying about the string of violence? Well, the simple answer is police are concerned. They're calling this string of stabbings and violent incidents with weapons a growing trend officers are seeing on the streets. In the first four months of the year, Victoria Police says there have been 20 assaults with a knife. Similar numbers to the last four years. But Police Chief Delmonic says there is a rise in knives and edge weapons being carried by people for protection. When you see the frequency of the stabbings and the violence playing out in our communities, uh, I can't tell you really with any confidence to say well, it's okay, you know, we're safe and it's gonna be okay. The numbers don't really, you know, are kind of aligned to what it has been for the last four years. Um, it's concerning. And, and I think that we, we're going to be getting into this is what's at the root cause of it? What are we doing? Zora, many of these attacks are taking place in downtown Victoria. How have stores and, and businesses been handling this? Well, Dan, the Downtown Victoria Business Association says it wants to spend more time marketing its events downtown. Instead, most of its energy has been put into dealing with violence. I think it's important for us also to remember that we create, to a certain extent, a big piece of the safety of the downtown. And I always want to urge uh, our residents to make sure that they pay attention to the part they play in the sense that we really do need to continue to support our downtown businesses and all of our services. 
Now, Dan, a panel discussing how to make communities safer was held earlier today in Victoria. Housing officials, mental health advocates and police got together and discussed ways to make people feel safer in their city and their homes. Dan. Zora Premji, thanks very much. Vancouver Park Rangers have been removing some tents at Crab Park and asking others to take down temporary structures. Tuesday's enforcement focused on a hillside outside a designated temporary sheltering, sheltering area. But as Joe Ballard explains, some campers say they've nowhere else to go. For people like Z, being forced to pack up their belongings at Crab Park is a familiar feeling. She was a camper at Oppenheimer Park as well. I was decamped at that time and I'm going to be decamped again even though I have nowhere to be. Vancouver Park Rangers moved into Crab Park in the morning, telling people to tear down their tents. Z says she lost many of her belongings the last time she was told to move and she's worried history is repeating itself. Literally they're going to take everything I need to keep myself safe, warm and dry and mobilized and I'm going to be left with nothing. Campers on site were given time to pack up. For those who weren't there, park rangers threw out their tents. You're forcibly removing someone's home and you're putting all of their belongings into the garbage can. Some bystanders objected. The woman who lives in that tent wasn't here at the moment. She's going to return to a blank piece of grass with her tent and all her belongings somewhere. Park rangers were enforcing a bylaw on behalf of the Vancouver Park Board. It requires temporary shelters to be taken down during daytime hours. The board says that's to balance the needs of those who want to visit the park during the day. Less than a month ago, the city cleared people from this encampment to clean the area. They set up a designated site where campers could leave their tents up. But advocates say the city only made room for 14 tents. There's so many people that have been staying on this hillside, just desperately clinging to the hill, waiting for the chance to move into that designated area so they'd have some protection and be able to stay there until they can get housing. York says those asked to leave were not offered housing. Usually what happens is when people lose all their belongings, they end up going to somewhere that's even more and more remote, more precarious, more risky. For Z, the immediate future is very uncertain. Uh, yeah, I don't know where I'm going to go tonight and, and indefinitely. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. A recent Statistics Canada survey has found no fault evictions were the most common reason for a tenant to lose their home. Those include landlords moving into a unit, selling it, or doing major renovations. Nearly 6 in 10 evicted renters reported having trouble paying their bills, and 28% of them reported having a disability. StatScan cautions the data may be skewed by a small sample size. A Saskatchewan man accused of abducting his daughter and taking her here to B.C. to avoid getting the COVID-19 vaccine appeared in court today in Regina. Michael Gordon Jackson is representing himself at the trial. As Adam Hunter tells us, he called himself as the defense's first and only witness. Michael Gordon Jackson told the jury that he did not want his seven-year-old daughter vaccinated against COVID-19 in the fall of 2021. He shared custody with the girl's mother, but the mother had final say on matters of health and education. When he could not get a guarantee that the girl's mother would not vaccinate the seven-year-old against COVID-19, he decided to take matters into his own hands. He said based on the research he had done, he felt the vaccine was unsafe. So he took his daughter from Saskatchewan to BC. In February of 2022, he was arrested in Vernon, British Columbia. On the stand, Jackson told his version of events that led him to take his daughter without her mother's blessing. He says he did not believe a court would rule in a timely matter and call the situation desperate. During cross-examination, Jackson said that he took his daughter for two and a half months and that no one knew where they were. Well, he disagreed that what he did was extreme, although to his knowledge, he was the only parent in Canada to have taken this sort of action. He said, and I quote, it may seem extreme, but I felt I did the right thing. Jackson wrapped up his case without calling any other witnesses. Final arguments and the jury charge will happen on Thursday. Adam Hunter, CBC News, Regina. Transit riders in North Burnaby are asking the city to support a new rapid bus route. 
But the area's business association says that could hurt local stores. David Ball has more. Burnaby Heights, an area growing rapidly with new developments. But a battle is brewing over public transit. Some local residents say a lot more buses are needed, with current routes already plagued by crowding and delays. There's sometimes where the like there's other buses that are late, which we don't understand why. But yeah, we do need to better the service. And I don't understand why we're getting, they're increasing it and we still get quite crummy service. TransLink has plans to connect North Vancouver with Burnaby's Metro Town by rapid bus in the next 10 years. And Burnaby Transit advocates want it to include an all-day rapid bus lane along Hastings. The population is increasing, traffic's not going to get better and parking is not going to get better. So really the only thing we can do for our long-term planning is to propose new and better modes of transportation that's going to make it easier and better to move more people and get them where they need to go in the neighbourhood. But on the other side, the Heights Merchants Association has concerns. It says it supports improving transit, but fears any new full-time rapid bus lanes could hurt local shops by taking away parking. So with 360 businesses, we currently have 735 parking public parking spaces. And that sounds like a lot, but it's only two parking spaces per business. So when someone suggests, oh, you know, what are they making a big deal about losing one parking space? One parking space represents 50% of our business of our parking. TransLink says there's no actual plan for a dedicated bus lane just yet, and both groups will be heard ahead of any public consultations if one is proposed. Advocates say that's welcomed news. Pardon the pun, but we're trying to get a little bit ahead of the bus and be involved in conversations really early because if we can solve these problems now, I'd rather be doing that than reacting to everything after everything's been decided. TransLink says that any debate is welcome on public transit improvements in the region. David Ball, CBC News, Burnaby. If your car is capable of driving itself, listen up. The BC government has banned fully automated driving. Since the beginning of this month, operating a level three, four, or five vehicle is not allowed. This means highly automated self-driving cars and features cannot yet be driven on public roads in our province. The only exception is if it's through a pilot project under the Motor Vehicle Act. The province says the new rules are to protect vulnerable car users. Well, look who's back. Emerson, the juvenile elephant seal who's caused quite a splash for his urban forays into Victoria, has returned to the capital region. While fans might be happy to have him back, there is concern over Emerson's return and his apparent fondness for human attention. We caught up with people to talk about a seal who seems to enjoy that spotlight. A neighbor of ours who happened by this morning pointed him out that he's uh, in residence here. I did get to know him last year yep. when he was in the Songhees where I live. And he, he's a character. He's highly intelligent. Mm -hmm. And you try and figure out what's making him work. but. I think he's just like a teenager. He's kind of trying out different things. He it got taken away a couple of weeks ago, yep. put in a big van and taken, well, it seemed to me hundreds of miles away, and he's found his way back. How can he do that? It's really hard to say why a seal picks the particular beach, but it obviously has got everything that he needs, wants right now. And of course, this is a time of year when the elephant seals don't, they can't be at sea. They have to be on land. So he's picked a great spot and he's, he's sticking with it. We were getting multiple reports of people trying to pet him, uh, you know, get, getting their dogs to introduce uh, themselves to him. Uh, in one more egregious incident, uh, it was reported that somebody with their small child was getting uh, them to go up and touch their nose to, to the seals, you know, and it's, it's only going to end in tragedy. So the determination was made just because of the crowds he was drawing uh, that we needed to move him. You know, he doesn't have GPS, so <laughs> how does he uh, how does he know which way to go? It's uh, I was actually on the team that brought him to his new location and it was a perfect ele elephant seal uh, molting habitat, but he decided he liked Victoria more and and keeps coming back. So uh, yeah, an incredible feat, like you said, 34 kilometers a day, pretty much straight to get back here and found himself right back in Victoria again. Darius Madavi joins us with a first look at the weather. Hmm. So he's stubborn and he likes to sleep a lot. Yeah, he's a teenager for sure. <laughs> he is. But I mean, I, well, you've been to Victoria, Dan. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you want to go back? I would travel 34 kilometers a day to mm -hmm. get back. No? Um, yeah, I okay. get it. All right. I get it. Uh, but yeah. you don't molt. Thank I don't molt. God. No. 
Mm. <laughs> not as far as I know. <laughs> um, B, actually, that's not true. We all molt. Molting is just losing external features like your hair or a tusk. It's totally natural. Mm-hmm. Whenever you brush your hair, hair comes out. That's molting. So actually, Jim, light I do molting compared to what he goes. Um, yes, Here we are. definitely. And I'm less grumpy when it happens. <laughs> uh, now let's uh, let's turn to the weather. I just showed the the one to show the wind map off the top because honestly, there's not much weather to talk about. Some strong winds happening uh, off the coast of the island right now, especially if you're on the west coast of the island. Uh, but seriously. Not too much to worry about. No wind warning or anything like that. I just wanted to highlight maybe some strong winds around Victoria tomorrow in the Strait. But uh, overall, fairly calm. If we take a look at our satellite and radar map across the province, you can see those scattered showers and flurries still happening in parts of the interior. We do still have a risk of a thunderstorm for some parts of the southeast, particularly the East Kootenays and then Revelstoke and Golden, where we may see that uh, there as well. But overall, pretty calm. A couple lightning strikes on the other side of the border, but so far, Nothing here yet. Uh, We'll take a look at precipitation, actually, the forecast uh, later this hour. For now, we'll just talk about how it's going to be nothing but sunshine Mm -hmm. for the vast majority of the province tomorrow, including here in Vancouver. Good news for Emerson, too. Thanks. Thank you. It is a slow, sometimes painful process for people to rebuild their homes destroyed by the devastating wildfire in the West Kelowna area last August. So far, only 10 homeowners have applied for and received permits. And as we head into another fire season, Brady Strachan caught up with some people trying to start again. So my house was here. This would have been the yard. From Mariko Nagata, returning to the empty lot where her home once stood brings back tough emotions. Well, it doesn't feel great. Yeah. <laughs> it feels um, kind of sad because um, I had a lot of good memories here. The aggressive fire last summer scorched Nagata's home to the foundations, along with the home across the street, while many others in the neighborhood survived. It's just luck of the draw, Mother Nature. So you just never know. For the past eight months, she's been dealing with her insurance company, a long and complicated process to recoup all that she lost. It's stressful, for sure, but also there's not too much I can do about that, so... I just concentrate on the things that I can do something about, so. When the one-year anniversary of the fire comes this August, Nagata hopes to be rebuilding and carving out a new chapter in her life. Other people have started, so um, I'm hoping it's going to be soon. The McDougall Creek wildfire destroyed or damaged structures on nearly 200 properties last summer. While many lots have been cleared of debris, local government officials say they've only issued 10 building permits to people whose homes were damaged or destroyed. Just outside West Kelowna, the rural Bear Creek Road neighborhood was one of the worst hit areas by the fire. The blackened forest here, a vivid reminder of the destruction the fire left in its wake. I think the biggest part was seeing it come over the mountain because then you knew that it... Tammy Thomas is eager to get back on her property. So I built this. Yeah, it's all recycled materials. She's already rebuilding her life, bringing her animals back to the land. So we got loose squeal, <laughs> a.k.a. Lucy. Thomas, too, is dealing with her insurance adjuster and now waiting on bids from contractors. It's slow. It really a lot of patience like you it tests your patience i'm doing a lot of meditations and while the process to get rebuilding can be frustrating thomas says instead of dwelling on the past destruction she and many of her neighbors are just eager to move forward for us we're like we want to rebuild we love this property brady strachan cbc news west Kelowna. coming up more on what the federal budget means for you here in bc and when any promised help will find its way to those who need it. Stay with us. Thanks for joining our commercial free live stream tonight. In Edmonton, golfers have almost 20 courses to choose from. Several are right in the center of the city, but is that the best use of space for a growing region? A professor at the University of Alberta sat down with Radioactive's Min Dariwal to make his case for why the city ought to change some of those courses into spaces everyone can enjoy. The only thing that can happen on those courses during golf season is golf. I enjoy running and cycling in the River Valley, Mm -hmm. and I'm very much aware that, especially during golfing season, which is about to start, of course, all of those spaces are off limits for other uses. There are 19 golf courses in Edmonton, 
within the city limits and six on municipal land. The 20% of the river valley and ravine system is dedicated to this one sport. Have any other cities taken this step of removing municipally owned golf courses to make more public green space? A lot of cities are certainly thinking about it. And one of the reasons for that is that demand for golf is, is declining uh, over the long term. And the city of Ottawa actually is the one example that springs to mind. They did have one municipal golf course and they closed it uh, to allow it to be repurposed as a park um, to meet that, that need for other forms of recreation. Our city is growing. We're growing quite rapidly. We're going to have 2 million people here by 2050. And that's going to mean a lot more demand for recreational space, uh, especially in the center of the river valley. And that's where five of the six municipal courses are located, right uh, in some of the most accessible and sought after parts of the river valley, where there'll be increasing demand for all sorts of recreation in the future and not just golf. Mm hmm. As we told you, the Minister of Finance has presented this year's federal budget. Uh, the big ticket items include new spending for housing, Canada disability benefits, a national school food program, and a tax hike on wealthier Canadians. Andre Pavlov is a finance professor at Simon Fraser University and joins us now. Andre, thanks for being here. One of the surprising announcements was the plan to convert federal land and infrastructure to housing. What do you make of that plan, first of all? I'm not sure that's so surprising. Uh, that idea has been uh, presented before. Mm. I think it has taken a more concrete shape at the moment. I love the direction of this. Uh, we, it, it recognizes the fact that we need more land and more housing. Um, I'm not sure it goes far enough. Uh, so, for example, the budget mentioned that in the first uh, wave, there will be um, uh, land for 800 properties. Now, 800 properties compared to the 4 million that, uh, or 3.9 million that we need to build, um, you know, that mm -hmm. obviously tells you that the current uh, plan is is very, very minuscule, mm -hmm. but at least it's in the right direction. Yeah, and, and it would depend on how much, how many units, if they are going to be building units on those uh, former uh, uh, federal lands would be, would be able to fit on there. The, the budget will hike also, as we mentioned, capital gain taxes paid by wealthier Canadians and corporations to collect an estimated $19 billion in new revenue, lots of new spending in this budget. How do you think this will impact housing developments? Yeah, people talk about this as a capital gain tax, which it is, but I really call it a real estate tax. And the reason it's a real estate or a housing tax is that if you put your retirement savings in the stock market, you can sell a little bit at a time and never reach the 250,000 threshold for the higher capital gain uh, tax rate. But if you buy um, even a basic single unit and, and rent it over 10 or 20 years, that unit surely is gonna appreciate more than, uh, than the 250,000 
uh, dollar limit. So uh, it really, this starts the way it's designed right now. It really um, will capture most real estate investments. There were a number of loans introduced as well meant to support rental builds. Who are those uh, overall meant to support, do you think? Yeah, so there are a couple of programs. For example, the um, apartment construction loan program or um, reaching homes. Um, there, you know, there are substantial numbers. Uh, for example, one of them is $15 billion. Um, but just to give you, to put that in perspective, 15 billion um, compared to you know one or two trillion that we need to build the uh, 3.9 million uh, homes is really a drop in the bucket. That's um, that's not gonna really certainly it's not gonna solve our housing crisis, but it really is so small. Even though it's a big number, it's so small that uh, it's hardly gonna make any difference. Andre Pavlov is a finance professor at SFU. Andre, thanks for your time today. Thank you for having me. Coming up, the UK wants to ban anyone under the age of 15 from smoking for the rest of their lives. That story's next. It is National Volunteer Week here in Canada. In Saskatchewan, 10 volunteers were recognized for their decades of service, including a woman who fought for labor rights for working mothers. When my daughter was born, I wanted to come back. Childcare was a big issue, as it is today for a lot of mothers. Um, I wanted to come back to work um, part time. And um, I actually wanted to job share with another woman who also had a child the same age. And so we went to our boss and we said, look, we have this arrangement. I will work in the morning, she'll come in the afternoon and we can look after each other's children. And our boss said, no, that is not something that is acceptable. And we're talking about 1970. 980 in those eras. So one of the areas I'm very passionate about, I see women um, moving forward with that, is that this became a big issue and I was on a national advisory committee to try and look at different options for parents to work at. And uh, with the national advisory committee, we went in on to uh, collective agreements that look after leave with income averaging, part-time work, um, you know, women that can work um, in the winter months so that they're not working in the summer when children are home, those kind of initiatives that are now in a lot of collective agreements. The other one was we really pushed uh, EI to try and have um, programs that allowed you to collect EI that was topped up and things like that. So it went through the collective agreement, but it really came through the National Advisory Committee. So that is my that is my proud moment. Yeah. Custed says she was inspired by her father, who moved the family to Canada from Kenya in the 1960s. She says as an immigrant woman and working mother in the early 80s, she faced a lot of discrimination. Lieutenant Governor Ross Morasti says the Saskatchewan Volunteer Medals honor people who went above and beyond for others without expecting anything in return.
Angry surgery patients in Ontario are speaking out after paying hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars to private clinics for procedures already covered by the province or extra services not medically necessary. Health advocates call it predatory upselling. Christine Burak spoke to one woman who fell for it. Diagnostic test, $300 per eye. Kate Armstrong Lens wants her money back. Legally blind in one eye and barely seeing out of the other in 2022, she says a surgeon at a Toronto hospital told her if she went to his private for-profit clinic, she could get her cataract surgery faster. So she went and signed contracts she could barely see. How do you ask questions when you can't read? Armstrong signed off on $1,200 in diagnostic and measurement tests, over $3,000 for her first cataract surgery and nearly $3,500 for the second, money the province would have paid. $8,000 is not what I had then, and I had to borrow it, and I had to cash in our RSPs. Healthcare advocates say a growing number of Ontarians are in the same boat. All medically needed cataract surgery is covered. Every hospital can handle medically needed cataract surgeries. And if you're being told anything else in a private clinic, that is not the truth. A single cataract surgery takes roughly seven minutes. Currently in Ontario, the longest average wait time is three and a half months. A CBC News investigation found the Ontario government pays public hospitals about $500 per surgery. It pays private clinics up to $1,300 for the same work, so patients should not be charged. Ontario's health minister insists few patients are using their credit cards. And the numbers show it is a very, very small group that have to have that investigation, ultimately get reimbursed when appropriate, and corrective action is taken. The most recent Health Canada numbers show for-profit clinics charge Canadians nearly $80 million for medically necessary services. People are blindly, excuse the pun, being ripped off. Armstrong won't likely be reimbursed because she signed the contracts. She says the trust she once placed in doctors is gone. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. To a health story overseas now. The UK's plan to pass a strict smoking ban has cleared its first hurdle. The measure would make it illegal to sell cigarettes to anyone currently aged 15 or under for the rest of their lives. Margaret Evans has more from London. The first smoke-free generation. That's what the British government is hoping its legislation will build if, as expected, it eventually becomes law here. The Tobacco and Vapes Bill seeks to make it illegal for anyone born after January 2009 to buy cigarettes or tobacco. There is no liberty in addiction. Nicotine robs people of their freedom to choose. The eyes have it. The bill easily passed its first full vote at Westminster, despite some high-profile opposition. The instinct of this establishment is to believe that they, that the government, are better at making decisions for people than people themselves. There is a brave new world feel to it and some mixed opinions. It's a nice idea to create a perfect society, but if you accept that it's not a perfect society that you can breed good habits into, then what are you going to do about it? Tobacco use is considered the largest preventable cause of death in the United Kingdom. And the idea is, forgive the pun, to stamp out any possibility of children becoming addicted in the first place. One of the best flavours. The legislation also targets vaping, aimed at making flavours and packaging less appealing to young people. So that's entice younger generation to... Shop owner Twi Nguyen says she got into the vape business to help people get away from cigarettes. She backs efforts to protect children from both, but worries a complete ban will make it more attractive. Anything you make forbidden, people want. So kids will want it more. They want to, you know, use someone else's ID, try and find an ID that they're not... You know, there's always a way around it. About 60% of people here are said to favour phasing out tobacco. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London.
Former U.S. President Donald Trump was back in a Manhattan courtroom for day two of jury selection at his historic criminal trial. It centers on an alleged hush money payment he made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Seven of 12 jurors and six alternates were chosen today, but not before the judge warned the former president against jury intimidation after he was heard talking toward a prospective juror. The CBC's Chris Reyes has more from outside the courthouse. Another full day of jury selection in the criminal case against Donald Trump in the state of New York. In the courtroom, one potential juror after another answered an exhaustive questionnaire from the judge and faced follow-up questions from lawyers on both sides. More than a few were once again dismissed because they admitted they couldn't promise to be impartial or unbiased. Outside the courthouse, we talked to one potential juror who was dismissed because of her work schedule. It was a little bit surreal. I mean, uh, to see, to, to be that close to a former president, uh, someone who has been uh, on, on the news, um, in the public eye so much. I wish I could have stayed for the entire trial. Um, it's fascinating. It's unprecedented. Trump is facing felony charges of falsifying business records in connection with hush money payment made to three different people, including the adult film star Stormy Daniels. He could face jail time. Outside the courtroom, Trump maintained his innocence. I was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense. Some accountant, I didn't know, marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was. And you get indicted over that? During the proceedings, lawyers on both sides reminded the potential jurors that their job will be to consider only the evidence and facts presented in the case. You got a sense that people were really trying to put anything that they had brought to this aside and step in and do their civic duty. Once the jury is selected and sworn in, opening statements are next. This trial is expected to last two months. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. In the Middle East, Israel is standing firm on its promise to retaliate against Iran for Saturday's massive aerial attack. But as the CBC's Chris Brown explains, it's still unclear what that response will look like or when it will happen. Israel's military apparently pulled this intercepted Iranian ballistic missile out of the Dead Sea, putting it on show to demonstrate how much damage it could have done. It's a dangerous escalation. Iran says it was Israel that actually fired first by killing two of its generals in a Syrian diplomatic consulate on April the 1st. And its foreign minister continues to warn if Israel retaliates, Iran's response will be immediate and severe. But before Saturday night, Iran had never directly hit Israel. And Israel's leaders are now trying to build a case at simply letting it go to de-escalate, as many countries, including the United States, are urging, is not an option. On a visit with new military recruits, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu tried to connect Iran's attack to Israel's now six-month-long war against Hamas in Gaza. Iran stands behind Hamas, behind Hezbollah, he said. It's part of a much bigger system. This former Israeli diplomat says Netanyahu will do whatever is most likely to keep him in power. He will be trounced in any election, which is why he's trying to prolong the war in Gaza. Which, we, which is why he's trying to maintain a war atmosphere via Iran, because that, that postpones um, um, every, every uh, um, uh, political play. For the moment, Iran has shifted the focus off Gaza and the immense criticism Israel has faced for the destruction and suffering it's inflicted. But Alan Pincus doubts Israel can avoid Gaza for long. If Iran goes away, he gets the accolades for, for exercising your strength, but then attention goes back to Gaza. He loses. If he attacks Iran, he loses. Um, he's in a no-win situation. In Tel Aviv, people were anxious, but many also supported a reprisal against Iran. A targeted strike like that was the best move, and a continued targeted strike is the continued best move. It shows measure without overplaying a hand. I believe that if we do a violence, it will drag more violence, and I don't believe that we should continue doing so. Several European foreign ministers are reportedly making their way to Israel to make their case in person that Israel should consider the larger strategic issues. Chris Brown, CBC News, Jerusalem.
As we head into another wildfire season, crews are preparing physically and mentally. After the break, the many tolls of keeping people safe. Stay with us. Red ear slider turtle. They are not a native species here. They come from Florida in the southern states where it's uh, warmer typically. So, this is your generic pet store turtle that the size of a loony you buy and you're like, oh, that are gonna stay small. Unfortunately, they don't stay small and they get too big for tanks, so people unfortunately just release them into the wild. And it was thought that they would not successfully overwinter and they would die off. Unfortunately, though, they have decided that they are capable of overwintering in our Ontario waters. And they pose a big threat to our native species of turtles, like the painted turtle and the map turtle, because they are much larger than the other turtles and they have a very, very um, advanced diet. So instead of eating just a bit of vegetation, they'll eat all the vegetation, the fish, they'll eat anything they can really get their hands on. I saw one this morning, they're at Ojibwe. There's a, a load of them at Ojibwe. It would fit comfortably in the palm of my hand. And then this one here is massive. Yeah, so this is a pretty big female. Uh, she came into our care last year. Um, it's illegal to release red ear sliders back into the wild. So we're currently holding on to her until we can find her a forever home. They are a very long lived turtle. One turtle in captivity that we work with is just over 60. They can live quite a long time, especially in the wild. This past summer was Canada's worst wildfire season on record and one of the deadliest. Eight firefighters and contractors were killed on the job. A group of new firefighting recruits is now wrapping up their training in Alberta. Along with the physical demands, they're learning about the mental hazards that can come with that grinding work. The CBC's Julia Wong has their stories. Aaron Kurd says this is where he belongs, on the front lines of the wildfire fight. I was actually watching the media uh, about last year and I saw how uh, I saw how the wildfires were impacting the communities here in Alberta and how it was actually impacting the rest of Canada as well. I felt like that, uh, that this could be a cause that I could uh, contribute to. Kurd, who used to be in the military, is among more than 500 people trained this season to work with helicopters, lay down equipment and respond to fires. But Kurd says he's been preparing psychologically as well. I like uh, taking my own time, really separating myself from, um, from my job sometimes if it gets really busy, and then uh, just focusing on myself and what I need to do. 
Last year, Canada saw its worst wildfire season in a century. Fires started early and were unrelenting. With dry conditions in Alberta, this year may be no different in the province. Because the seasons are longer and more intense, uh, it requires us to be very clear about what fatigue and cumulative fatigue looks like, be really clear about some of the mental health issues that can come as a result of working extended shifts many days throughout the entire summer. Make sure that we've got a little slack in the hose there. And mental health is one of the things instructors want recruits to be more open about. We always talk about uh, the hazard of fire behavior, slip trips, falls. The mental health hazards are equally important and we need to make sure that we're trying to get that into our everyday conversation. That's not to say the physical risks of the job have been forgotten. Eight people working on wildfires died last season, according to a report by Natural Resources Canada. We certainly are, are open in talking about the past as a learning experience. Uh, so what can we learn from those really unfortunate um, deaths, fatalities, serious injuries? For Kurd, even with all that considered, he's ready for what this season could bring. We're all very aware of what we have moving forward um, and just keeping healthy, um, keeping, our, keeping our morale up. A job that could see him working for weeks at a time, putting the lessons he's learned to the test. Julia Wong, CBC News, Hinton, Alberta. Well, the sky lit up overnight in Campbell River with a rare show of the northern lights, also known as Aurora Borealis. Have a look. Shades of blue, green, and pink undulated across the expanse between 2.30 and 5 a.m. The best time to see the lights in B.C. is during clear winter nights, so this may be one of its final appearances of the year. The lights were also visible, visible in Prince George. Darius Madabi, did you see them? I, no, I mm -hmm. wish. I wish mm -hmm. I had dri driven up to Prince George mm -hmm. or Campbell River so I could Quick eight them. hours, there you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, next time, mm -hmm. next time. And there will be more opportunities, I should say, even though this year the season, the best season is coming to a close, uh, you can see them during any really clear, dark night. So as the days get longer and the nights get shorter, you don't have as good a chance, but you still can. Uh, yesterday, the sun was particularly active. There's sort of a 30-day cycle mm -hmm. in how active the sun is. And just sort of shorter, shorter time scales. On larger time scales, though, also an 11-year cycle, and we are heading into solar maximum. So you can see here uh, that is to, closer to solar minimum. This is closer to solar maximum. You can see the difference in activity here. Lots okay. more sunspots, lots more emissions of those uh, those charged particles that give us the northern lights. So over the next couple of years, you still have a chance to see the northern lights, even if you're a little bit further south than where you typically get to see them. So a bit of good news there. Uh, now let's turn to the weather. Also kind of exciting, we've got a special pattern setting up called an omega block. This is going to be a pretty short-lived one. Maybe it shouldn't quite qualify because it's not sticking around for too long, but I just wanted the excuse to talk about it, really. Uh, an omega block happens when you have a high-pressure system in between two low-pressure systems, so the jet stream will kind of go like this around it, and that means this high-pressure system can get stuck in place. And so this one is going to be sitting over BC through the end of this week. Uh, it'll start to move further east as we head into the weekend, allowing this trough of low pressure to head in and get uh, us here on uh, the coast and on the island. Uh, so this is Thursday, high pressure still sitting over. That means we're gonna be sunny. We're gonna be dry through the end of the week. Uh, the interior getting that continuing into the weekend, but here you can see that high pressure moving over and then that low pressure trough gets to come in. So we might see a little bit of rain as we get into Saturday. So that's why we can make it a little bit of a wetter weekend. If we take a look at our precipitation forecast, that's gonna be the case. That last bit of snow, last bit of showers heading off and then really quite dry until we get into the weekend and we maybe get a little bit more precipitation coming to the coast. This doesn't actually show us the weekend, so just have to take my word for it for now. But at least you know that over the next few days, sunny, dry, very little cloud for most places. Uh, if we take a look at temperatures, those staying low for parts of the interior, slowly going to be crawling back up to uh, above seasonal as we head into the weekend for the interior. Here on the coast, back around seasonal, maybe a couple degrees above, and then they're going to come down a little bit again as we get into the weekend to get that rain again. But generally, very calm conditions. Southeast getting a little bit more precipitation, but not too much at all. And here in Vancouver, we've got three days of sun and then maybe some showerier conditions as we get into the weekend. Dan. Okay. Darius, thanks very much. Thank you. The Canucks play their final home game tonight before heading into the Stanley Cup playoffs. We caught up with some fans to see how they're feeling. You'll hear from them after this.
the time. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. On May 9th, join CBC Vancouver's Dan Burrett at the Surrey Board of Trade's Top 25 Under 25 Awards, celebrating the incredible initiatives of Surrey's youth. And CBC Vancouver is the exclusive media partner of the DOXA Documentary Film Festival, May 2nd at 12th. Enjoy thoughtful and engaging documentaries, special presentations, and industry events. For festival information, visit doxafestival.ca. torch has been lit, the relay is underway, and the countdown to the 2024 Paris Summer Olympics has begun. Usually the power of the sun is used to light the flame, but with a parabolic mirror. But it was too cloudy in Olympia, Greece today, so used another method. The 2024 Paris Games start on July 26, and you can catch all the action right here on CBC. Team Canada has also unveiled its new look for this year's Olympics. Canada's Olympic and Paralympic athletes will have three different uniforms to wear throughout the Summer Games. And here's Phil, who competes in braking and is showcasing functionality through movement. Indeed. The athletes will have separate outfits for the opening ceremony, their media appearances, and the closing ceremony. The uniforms, designed by Lululemon, provide support for various body types and abilities. They include features like magnetic closed zippers, pull-on loops, and sensory touch guides. The convertible styles have breathable mesh and will wick away sweat to keep the athletes comfortable in Paris' changing and sometimes stifling summer weather. The graphics highlight Canada's history and diversity with interpretations of art, architecture, and nature. And everyone will have an opinion on them. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> what are you excited to see? 
Uh, down, oh, well, you already said, uh, what's it called? Break dancing? Yeah, break Love dancing. That. Yeah. That's your favorite? Yeah, I'll go with or, that. Well, uh, it's new this year, so I'm excited for that. But also okay. swimming. Ah, uh, yeah, very fun. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't yet know when the Stanley Cup playoffs will start, Dan, mm -hmm. but the NHL has said the puck could drop as soon as this Saturday. And if the Canucks win tonight, they will lock down first place in the Pacific Division. Fans were out this afternoon to show their support. I mean, my dad goes for them, so I go for them. <laughs> I'm excited that we haven't been in there for so long. Well, I think this is the year. If we're gonna, if we're gonna win it, <laughs> this is the year. I am so excited. It's been so long, but I think that we finally done enough work yeah and I think we're, we're we're ready yeah absolutely I'm excited they're a bit expensive but we're still gonna be here hopefully if there's a big screen or something we'll be downtown watching no riots this year though everything but that that's what we're gonna try and prevent best so behavior. absolutely best behavior nobody's getting hurt no cop cars getting flipped we'll be good we're gonna win the cup so that's why all right Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. Watch this newscast on CBC GM, our free app, as well as on YouTube and our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Zara PMG will have your next local news at 11 o'clock, right after the National. Have a good night.